The word in Hebrew is rakia. It is Strong's number 7549. You can look up at Brown's Driver's Briggs or Strong's Concordance or any place like that. You'll see that it is a solid structure as if beaten out. It's, it's a construct of some sort. Um, it's a base, it's a support. The firmament regarded by Hebrews as solid supporting the waters above it. Now, many modern translations will use the word expanse because they want to justify the expanse of space. You know, space, the final frontier, right? These are the voyages. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I wanted to be that guy to boldly go where no man has gone before, even though everywhere they went, they met men who spoke English. <laughs> um, I wanted to do that. <laughs> and words like expanse help make that possible. Unfortunately, the firmament does not make that possible. In the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, when they, the, the Hebrew scholars took their Hebrew Torah and translated it into the Greek and the Septuagint, they chose the word stereoma, which has the same word. Actually, even more so, it conveys the word of solidity and a structure that supports something else. Um, but still, you have other scholars out there who will beg to differ. All right, so the expanse in the midst of the waters, that's the rakia. It's not a solid dome like the flat earthers want you to believe, or even good scholars like Dr. Michael Heiser and others who would say that this is a dome. Uh, I just happen to disagree with him. Oh, well, the Earth's flat and it has this dome above it called the firmament, this ice dome or water dome or whatever. But this is false. When the Bible says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters that divides the waters from the waters and dividing the waters under the firmament from the waters above the firmament, this is simply dividing the water that's on this earth, the water that you know is in the seas and the lakes and the rivers, referring to that being separated from the water that is in the atmosphere. You know, when we have clouds above us, that's water up there, okay? That's moisture up there, that's H2O. So the waters above the firmament are the waters that are up in the atmosphere in the form of clouds. That's all, the firmament is called heaven. Well, what does the Bible define heaven as? The sky, okay? Now, there are multiple heavens. The Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 the, being caught up to the third heaven, you know, because there's the heaven as in the sky. There's the heaven as in, you know, uh, uh, space in a sense with the stars and the moon and the sun in it. That's also called heaven. And then there's heaven, the place where God lives. That's why it's called the third heaven because there are three heavens. Okay, so there are also three firmaments. Okay, there's the firmament in the sense of the sky, in the sense of outer space, and in the sense of where God lives. Okay, so people just don't understand the word firmament because it's a word that we don't use in our modern vernacular whatsoever. But it's these, basically it's these layers as you go outward is, is what the firmament is. So you have a, a layer of water where you're underwater, then you have a layer of atmosphere, and then you have water that's in the atmosphere, then you have another layer of outer space, and then you have where God lives. So again, this thing of the firmament being an ice dome, the, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible just says there are waters above the firmament. Oh, wow. It's, it's talking about clouds in the sky. Oven theory would be the first heaven is the atmosphere that we're breathing up. Maybe it used to be maybe 10 miles thick, and now it's expanded out to 50 or 60 miles. Who cares? It used to have a atmosphere. <clears throat> I'm going to pick a number and say 10 miles thick. A layer of ice, maybe three fingers thick, like Josephus and the Jews taught, uh, you know, have always taught. Then stars with bazillions of stars in it going who knows how far. And then another crystalline firmament. And beyond that, I don't know. Uh, but Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Lack of understanding the three level heavens is what leads the flat earthers belief that of what would seem very logical, actually, if, if there was only one heaven with one firmament. So... In their defense, it may not seem so outrageous as most of us might think. True Bible cosmology, however, tells us that there are three different realms with three different firmaments separating them from one another. So the first heaven would be where the birds fly, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven where God lives. And God said, let there be a firmament, a firmament, a firmament, a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. <laughs> Who would have thought you could turn Alexander Scorby into a rapper? <laughs> a firmament, the firmament. 
sorry guys, <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, you can look up in various Bible software and, and online tools like Blue Letter Bible, again, telling you that this thing is solid, it's a support structure, uh, it's holding back the waters, you know, Yahuwah's throne is on top of this thing. Over and over again, the Hebrews descri described it as a hard structure. It comes from a root word, raka, which means to bat beat down, flatten out, like as if beaten out metal for the, like the labor in the tabernacle. How do you beat out air? How do you beat out gas, the vacuum of space? No, it's a hard structure. We talked about earlier, how should we understand scripture? Well, scripture uses internal witnesses also, right? So we can look up definitions of words, but then the scriptures itself will confirm it through internal witnesses. So we have other internal witnesses telling us that this is a hard structure up there, like Job 37.18. I like to use biblehub.com, uh, a lot of good, uh, or .cc, I forget what it is, bible.cc, Bible biblehub. Uh, where you can see all the parallel translations right there, you know, talking about in Job 37, 18, that, uh, that the sky is hard like cast metal, like a molten looking glass. It is a hard structure in Job 37, 18. Also in Proverbs 8, 28, that he made firm the skies above. So you have two internal witnesses right there in scripture. Well, why does it need to be a hard, firm, solid structure? Well, because... What's, what was its function? It separates the waters from the waters. It's still doing that to this day. We see that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And we see David writing many, many, many years, even after the flood, saying that there are waters that still be above the heavens. It also needs to be hard because that's the location of Yahuwah's throne. His throne is sitting on top of this thing. We see in Ezekiel 1.26, uh, and above the firmament was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. We see the same thing in Isaiah 66, 1. The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of footstool spins at 1,000 miles an hour and runs away from you at 66,000 miles an hour? Is, is, is God in a heavenly Disney world or what? I mean, what kind of footstool is that? Uh, and this is my favorite verse right here uh, when it comes to this. Amos 9, 6. It says he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth in the New American Standard Bible. Why does the New American Standard Bible render it that way? Well, it's because the Hebrew word is aguda, uh, and it means a vault or a solid dome. Now, King James translated it as troop. Why? Well, what is a troop? I was in C Troop 1st and 1 10th Air Cav when I was in the military. A troop is a tightly knit unit of men. The word conveys something that is tightly knit, a unit that is tightly knit together. In this case, it is the heavens tightly knit to the earth, attached to the earth. The heavens are attached to the earth. Again, you can look up multiple translations on that using uh, online sources like that, and you'll see all kinds of stuff related to founding the heavenly vault upon the earth. Over and over and over again, you see that in the various English translations. Again, showing the same thing here, more English translations, founded his vault upon the earth. What's even uh, something pretty cool to do is you could you go on a resource like that where they have foreign languages there as well. Now, I realize Google Translate doesn't always translate perfectly, but if you could go there and take like the Afrikaans version of the scriptures, highlight, copy, and paste the, uh, their language into Google Translate, and you'll see it talks about the heaven. He's set, he has settled his dome on the earth. Do the same thing with the Albanians. You'll see that the upper chambers in heavens and places the foundations of his heavenly cup, his heavenly cup, huh, on the earth. The Chinese talking about building the heavens and settle the heavens on the earth and to pour out the sea water on the earth. Yahuwah is his name. Koreans, same thing. Temple in heaven laid the foundations of that expanse on the earth. Russian, same thing. Upper palaces in the heavens set up his vault on the earth. So what you end up with when you go through the various scriptures, and there are many of them, a lot more than just two, uh, there are many scriptures that describe a circular enclosed world system set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four. You simply can't escape it. It's all over the scriptures. Uh, this is a graphic done by Logos Bible Software. They really hate it when I share it. Uh, and I had some interesting dialogue with them back and forth on this because they wanted to get me for copyright. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Your own software allows people to freely share this on Facebook and everything, so why are you coming after me? Well, because a whole lot of people were seeing this and realized, well, if that's what the Bible says, okay. And they don't believe that. So I'm like, what's the matter, guys? Don't you stand by your own software? Don't you stand by what the Word of God says that you say it says? I'm going to use that graphic because I have freedom to do so under the, under the copyright. 
fair use law. I can do that because I'm making commentary on it. And that's what the scriptures teach. And even their highly ranked scholars at Logos Bible Software agree, even though they don't actually agree. <laughs> they agree that's what the Bible says, but then they don't want to believe it. Scripture says, uh, and God called the firmament, the rakia, the beaten down metallic structure, heaven, shamaim, in Genesis 1.8. And we see in Isaiah 40, 21 and 22, everybody likes to go to verse 22, but I'm going to back up to 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning, i.e. Genesis? You have to realize Isaiah is one of the last guys to be writing about this. He's writing what he's writing in the context of all who had come before them, including Moses and Genesis. So all these Torah teachers that are coming after me, they don't like me talking about this, you say, look, you guys are teaching Torah. This is book, first book of the Torah, chapter one. Don't blame Rob, Moses, he wrote it. <laughs> don't blame Rob Skiba for this flat earth thing in the Torah movement. Blame Moses. Oh, if you want to go even further than that, he's talked face to face with who? For how long? It, twice? Face to face as one speaks with a friend. So you got to work with me here on that one. The creator is talking with the guy who's writing down how the creation happened. And he wrote it like this. And Isaiah is referring back to him. Have you not heard from the foundations of the earth, foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens, the Shamaim, as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. What's happening when we use the word as or like? Simile. So don't you think it would help if you're going to use allegorical language, a metaphor, a simile, that it would help to use something that would at least paint a picture in the listener's mind that even remotely resembles what you're talking about? Those evil flat earthers were all trying to create some kind of big evil conspiracy to make the Bible look stupid and Christians look stupid and whatever. Uh, yeah, so Michael Rood comes on and basically it says that, well, not basically, he tells you that you are a moron, an idiot, if you take the Bible literally. And I'm going to let you hear from Michael himself. Um, many people have asked me, do I take the Bible literally? You would have to be a complete moron to take the Bible literally. Now, I have to say, as you go through this video, it is literally full of some rather funny irony. For instance, he just said, if you take the Bible literally, you are a moron. Then watch what happens with Kent. Now, you said moron is below idiot? Idiot? Uh, yeah. I idiot, uh, idios, one's own, and then moron. Uh, the, the five wise virgins and the five moron virgins. Right, right. And, so less uh, than an so, idiot. Okay. Well, <laughs> I can't think of a better word for it. Right, Another right. Another option so is. They, you know, the, the, those terms have fallen out of use in, in modern day. I'll bring uh, them back. I'll bring, yeah, yeah. I'll bring I think it's, it's time that we bring these things back in their biblical context. And so you've got the floor. Okay. Well, my name's Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. And I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. Moron. I would say I love the Bible. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. Moron. <laughs> it's just priceless. Oh, boy. All right. So uh, now I'm going to play a few clips from different people and just to show you what the old attitude was and what the new attitude towards Scripture is today, at least with a growing number of people. Michael Rood obviously leading the pack. I've studied the Bible for about 65 years, and every t all through those years, I often had to change my views as I learned more. But in summarizing all that, I was stunned to realize that every time I had to change my views about the text, it was always in the direction of taking it more seriously than before. I be as an information scientist, I've now learned that the key is precision. Be precise with words. You sometimes have to be even more precise than your translators were. God's own words. The Old Testament presents it as God's actual speech. In 1 Kings 22 and Nehemiah 8 and in the Psalms several places in Jeremiah, clearly the intent is, is the representation is the, these were literally God's own words. This is a call to literalness. Jesus clearly uh, indicated that we should be taking it very, very literally, very strictly. You would have to be a complete moron to take the Bible literally. If the church compromises God's word in Genesis, 
what's going to happen is they're going to compromise in other parts of Scripture. And my point is, all I was doing was really speaking to people from the Bible and saying, here's what the Bible says. Moron. Now I'll play a few clips that point out why this is actually an important issue. Genesis is the beginning of so many things, and if Christians don't get a handle on Genesis, can they really get a handle on the rest of the Bible? Well, I'll tell you what, Genesis is so foundational. I, you know, most people don't realize that every major doctrine of theology, whether directly or indirectly, ultimately go back to the book of Genesis. That's how important the book of Genesis is. For example, why do we have the seven-day week? Well, God created in six days, and he rested on the seventh. Uh, why do we wear clothes? That goes back to Genesis. Uh, uh, what, what about marriage? That goes back to Genesis and so on. These doctrines go back there. fact is, the gospel itself originates in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of mankind. That's why we need rescuing. That's why Jesus needed to step into history to save us from de sin and death. It ultimately goes back uh, to the early chapters in Genesis. You see, Genesis is so foundational to everything else in the Bible that it would almost be crazy not to start with Genesis and not to trust it. I believe that the Bible is inspired by the Father. Yahweh has inspired in His Word all truth. And so if the Father knows best, then by implication the Bible knows best as well. So for me, I want to know that what I really do on a weekly basis and this God that I claim to believe in is real. It's really important for me that He's real. And the pages of the Bible are real and they're reliable that I can trust this book that I study so much and I want to know that it's worth the effort. And so it is exciting to see that there is phenomenal evidence to see that it's not fantasy, but it's actually fact. The more literal we take the Bible, the more, more we're going to see things just begin to jump out at us. I love teaching the Bible. And uh, just to let you know, the way that my, what we call hermeneutic, the way I interpret Scripture is to take it as literally as possible. And I find that when you take things literally, these pieces just start to fit together. It's amazing. It blows me away how everything starts to fit together. Moron. You yeah. know, these people are idiots. There are over 241 figures of speech that are used in the Bible, up to 40 varieties under each one of these figures. A, a brilliant scholar of the past, a Rabbi Ginsberg, who was the one, the, the Hebrew brains behind E.W. Bullinger's work, in figures of speech in the Bible, 1,100 pages cataloging not only the Hebrew, not only the Greek, but the Latin and English names of over 240 figures of speech. We have to understand these figures of speech because whenever a word or words fail to be true to fact, true to fact in the census world, they are always going to be figures of speech. And these figures of speech have been cataloged, they're known, and every language has different figures of speech that are utilized. And so to understand, to not, how, to not inaccurately interpret the Word of God, we have to understand that the Bible interprets itself. It does so right in the verse, right where it's written. It does so in the context, not only in the context of what is written, but also in the cultural context. So the figures of speech emphasize. If I said the ground is dry, it's a statement of fact. The ground is thirsty, the ground doesn't get thirsty. It is a figure of speech that is more picturesque. It adds to the, 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 the understanding. You, you get a picture in your mind what it is for the ground to be thirsty, and I don't have to define it for you. You already know, you have a picture because you have been thirsty, and you know what the ground looks like when there's been no rain on it, in, in a desert area, the Mojave Desert. And he's correct. Properly used figures of speech should convey in the mind of the hearer something at least remotely related to whatever it is you're using as a figure of speech. Same with poetry. If you're going to use poetry or, or, or speak in simile or utilize metaphors, symbolic language, whatever you are saying should at least in some way paint a picture in the listener's mind what it is that you're trying to discuss. For instance, Isaiah says, 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning, i.e. Genesis? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens, the Shemaim, as a curtain, and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. Now we have the word as being used there. It's not there for the word circle, but for the tent, it's there, because he's drawing, he's making a metaphor for you to think about. The heavens are stretched out over us like or as a tent. So we have a metaphor there. Well, in Isaiah's time, this would be a tent. If he's using a metaphor, people who are hearing his words would associate the metaphor. Okay, tent. It's a structure spread out over a flat surface. A tent. Modern times, something like this maybe. So that's just one of many examples that I could give. Obviously, when Isaiah used a figure of speech, circle of the earth, and inhabitants are as grasshoppers, and he spreads out the sky as a tent to dwell in, anybody who heard him automatically thought, okay, yeah, a tent, you know, a structure stretched out over a flat surface. Nobody would have had this in mind. <laughs> Nobody would have even imagined something like this being the truth behind the so-called figure of speech being employed. But beyond that, this is where it gets comical, at least to me anyway. When you don't understand figures of speech, when you've never spent time with 1,100 pages that are uh, readily available uh, in any community, Baker Bible Bookhouse still, still publishes this. If you don't wanna take the time to do it, then you have no qualifications to really speak about these things in the Bible. Okay, so if we haven't taken the time to read E.W. Bullinger's book on figures of speech, we have no business talking. Uh, first of all, you, you're assuming that guys like me have not read it, which would be false. Uh, but beyond that, this guy is saying there's hundreds of figures of speech, and E.W. Bullinger, who for many is a, an authoritative Bible scholar that people like to reference his work, He's done some great work. I actually love E.W. Bullinger for a number of things. I don't agree with him on everything, uh, certainly not on dispensation theology, which is surprising to me because he's a hardcore dispensationalist. And Michael Rood is, uh, you know, a Hebrew roots guy. So that's kind of weird. But beyond that, clearly Michael didn't do his research while he's mocking everybody else. He's mocking everybody because we haven't read Bullinger's work on figures of speech. Okay, so he is, no, hear me now, he is touting E.W. Bollinger as an expert on figures of speech and the usage of figures of speech in the Bible. And he's using this as in the context of saying anybody who takes the Bible literally when it comes to the shape and nature of the earth and the cosmos is an idiot, is a moron. And yet, E.W. Bollinger, who wrote the book on figures of speech, was a documented flat earther. <laughs> oh man, this is awesome. Somebody named Kevin Hobby compiled a whole bunch of newspaper articles from the late 1800s, early 1900s, showing how E.W. Bullinger was in fact a card carrying flat earther, apparently regularly speaking on the topic. So <laughs> the guy who wrote the book on figures of speech in the Bible apparently didn't think circle of the earth was a figure of speech for the globe because E.W. Bullinger was a flat earther, Michael. Uh, oh, oh, no. oh, come on. Or for the King James only types out there. Do it. <laughs> oh boy. Isn't that awesome? He's using Bullinger to say that we need to, not take the Bible literally. And anybody who does take the Bible literally is a complete moron because of what? What do you say? 240 something figures of speech. Woo! 240 figures of speech in a Bible. My King James Bible right here is what? 12, 1500 pages long. And we got 240 something figures of speech. So now we got to take the whole Bible as symbolic, allegorical, you know, poetic because of that. Is that what you're saying? Cause I'm a moron. If I take the rest of it, literally, no, I think it's more reasonable to realize, yes, there are figures of speech. Circle of the earth, meaning globe, is not one of them. 
as even evidenced by the belief system of the guy who wrote the book on figures of speech. But TV, be more funny. Ah! <laughs> oh boy. All right. So uh, here's another interesting piece of irony that uh, is coming out of all of this. And that is the whole idea that we are not to use private interpretation. Uh, so let's see what more words of wisdom Michael Rood has on that. There are people that will take these things out of context and they will twist them, they will mislead people, and they will cause divisions, and these are damnable heresies that are happening in this day and time. In 1 Peter uh, 1.20, he said, knowing this first, and when it comes to understanding the Bible, this is a foundational principle, knowing this first, primary, that no prophecy of the scripture, no prophetic scripture, is of any private interpretation. The word private interpretation, those two words in the Greek are idios epilusos. Idios, from which we word get the word one's own or idiot, and epilusus is letting loose. And when we let loose our own mind with our own interpretation unrelated to the context of the Bible and the understanding of the world around us, then we are falling into the category of what we would call in the modern day uh, parlance, an idiot. Well, we don't wanna be in that position. We don't want to get our own interpretation into the Bible, our own letting loose. We want to understand what do these holy men of God, what did they mean? What did the, their words mean to the people to whom they spoke at the time they spoke in the culture that they spoke so that we can understand if it applies to us today and how these things apply to us today. If I said it's as a tent or like a tent, what are you thinking about? So you mean you're not thinking about spinning galaxies for billions and billions and billions of years? Light years into the future? Uh. Hmm. No, <laughs> when Isaiah wrote that, he had this in mind. Something like a Bedouin tent, right? Or maybe perhaps a yurt. Or in modern times, you might think something like a dome tent. How many of you guys have heard of Andy Hoy? Few people. Uh, if you haven't, you need to check out his research, project314.org. Now, he's taking a beating, of course, too, because there's a certain paradigm regarding the tabernacle that people are, have their minds set on. But if you actually sit down and listen to what his argument is, and as a uh, structural engineer and a biblical literalist who understands the Hebrew, spent time in Israel studying the tabernacle, how many of you know the Torah says, do not add to it and do not subtract from it? So Andy's looking at all these models of the rectangular tabernacle in the wilderness, and he's going, wait a minute. They just added a whole bunch of extra tent pegs and rope and stuff like that, because why? A box is the least structural support you know, uh, that you can create out there in the wilderness. That thing's gonna slide over this way, that way, unless you have extra stuff to stabilize it. So he's going, huh. So he looked through it, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but long story short, totally unrelated to my research, he comes up with this, and then somebody says, hey, you need to check this out. And I had already, about the same time, had come up with this model right here. This is not, thus saith the Lord. This is, thus thinketh Rob. As Rob reads the scriptures, this is something I imagined in my head. Created that little, some of you guys probably can't see it, but you probably see my videos online anyway, uh, of Yahuwah's footstool. And somebody, and Andy saw that, and he's like, I need to contact that guy. <laughs> so he did. Uh, and we've got some videos out there on that. The book of Enoch talks about a, flooded dome enclosed world in chapter 89 tells you point blank there's a vision of the coming flood and he says I see a lofty roof and there's these seven torrents of water coming down and filling an enclosure <laughs> one two three four five times in the same chapter the water filled the enclosure so you, you know when you think about the worldwide flood Genesis talks about windows of heaven being opened right windows of heaven now we always just wrote that off to some kind of physical you know uh, uh, allegorical poetic language, but what if there were physical openings in a structure, a lofty roof, just like the ancients believed? You know, so when I look at these ancient texts, and th this is an elaborated version of, you know, of that model, uh, showing more components to it, but I gotta be honest, when I'm, I'm looking at these texts, and I'm like, well, which is a better fit for what I'm reading? The one on the left or the spinning ball thing hurling through space? Um, I gotta say, the one on the right didn't seem to fit the scriptures at all as I started going through it. And I told you, I was a NASA fanboy, Star Trek, Star Wars fan. Did not want to embrace this. Spent the better part of all of 2015 and a good part of 2016 crying a lot. <laughs>
because I had two very weighty things. I had the authoritative word of God that I have based my whole life on as my source for truth. And I had the Star Wars, Star Trek, science, NASA, cosmos over here that I wanted to be true. They are not compatible. Yeah, but God, yeah, but God, yeah, but God, praying, what do I do with this? Every night from April 2015 to about June, the uh, beginning of July 2016. Not boo-hoo, <laughs> but like praying, praying fervently to the point of tears. God, what do I do with this? And all he ever said to me is, I said what I said. For a whole year, I said what I said. He wasn't apologizing for it. He wasn't explaining it. He was like, deal with it. I said what I said. What are you going to do? Uh, well, eventually I finally, you know, that was an easy one, right? No, it wasn't that easy because I wanted both to be true. They're just not compatible. So I finally chucked this. And I got to tell you, a huge weight was lifted when I did that. A huge weight. Yeah, the, the, I don't like to use the word persecution because I've been a missionary and I've seen what real persecution is. But the verbal assaults, maybe I put it that way, certainly increased. But the favor and blessing of God increased with it like I've never experienced ever in my life. And everybody standing a few minutes ago is a, is a testimony to that. That's amazing to me. How, you know, of all the things that I've done in my life as a missionary and all kinds of other things, I've never seen fruit produced like this. And I've also never seen the kind of reaction that I've seen from people when you bring this topic up. Sweet old ladies that you would never in a million years imagine go completely insane in front of you. Friends that I had for a long time that were like the coolest people ever, just berserk. And that's when I began to realize there is a spiritual stronghold here. Nothing else explains that kind. You could say cognitive dis dissonance, sure. But no, I mean, I would see manifestations in people that you would never in a million years imagine just by simply saying I'm looking into this. And then I go and I look and I see people, again, bending scripture to me, preconceived biases. I happen to like Danny Faulkner. I've met him a few times, had some interesting conversations with him. As a human being, I think he's a really cool guy. Uh, as a creationist theologian, I think he's lacking in some things because he's still trying to hold on and make these things compatible. He wrote in his book, Universe by Design, page 96, he said, the translators of the Greek Septuagint rendered the Hebrew word rakia as stereoma, which Jerome followed as firmamentum in the Latin Vulgate, which in the AV, authorized King James Version, was transliterated as firmament. According to Danny, this is a terrible translation, and many modern translations break from this to render rakia as expanse, which he likes. The word stereoma conveys the meaning of something hard, such as the crystalline spheres of ancient Greek cosmology upon which the stars were implanted. Get this, he says, thus the translators of the Septuagint incorporated the current cosmology of their day into their own translation. That is very similar to those who wed the Big Bang to the Genesis creation account today. What's ironic to me is he's doing exactly that right here. But let's go ahead and look at the Septuagint because I think it's actually quite important. The story goes, 72 Jewish scholars, six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, according to Philo of Alexandria, were asked to, by the Greek king of Egypt, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, to translate the Torah from biblical Hebrew into Greek for inclusion in the library of Alexandria. The following narrative explains how this was done, and it is found in the pseudepigraphic letter of Aristius to his brother Philocrates. It is likewise repeated by Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, and by various later sources, including St. Augustine, among others. The story goes, King Ptolemy once gathered 72 elders. He placed them in 72 chambers, each of them in a separate one, without revealing to them why they were summoned. He entered each one's room and said, write for me the Torah of Moshe, your teacher. God put it in the heart of each one to translate identically as the others did. So do you really think 72 people separated to seven, in 72 different rooms were all taking the cosmology of the, of the Greeks, the pagans, as they're approaching their most sacred text, the Torah, and say, yeah, let's go ahead and use stereoma here? <laughs> or were they actually being faithful to the Hebrew word rakia and taking a Greek word that matches it and putting it in there? I suggest that's exactly what they did. The firmament for me was the key. It was what really broke the whole thing down. It's what sealed the deal in more ways than one. Unquestionably, the thing is hard. Job 37, 18, firm. Proverbs 8, 28, supporting the waters above. Genesis 1, 6 through 8, Psalm 148, 4, attached to the earth. Amos 9, 6, within which Yahuwah placed the sun, moon, and stars. Genesis 1, 14 through 19, and Psalm 19, 1 through 6, and upon which his throne sits. Ezekiel 1, 26, Isaiah 66, 1. Clearly, this is a very important issue to Yahuwah. 
Psalm 19.1. Those who don't yet believe, remember, you only have two verses. <laughs> two verses. That's all you got. Neither one of them work for you. Um, we've got a lot more to go. The only model that accommodates every aspect of the firmament is the circular enclosed world model. The only way around this is to grossly misrepresent the scriptures, yanking the true meaning of the words used out of context and fantasizing about definitions for those words which are not even remotely supported by the text or the historical context in which the scriptures were written. That brings us to the circle of the earth. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.